Welcome back, my friends. This is part four of Steal My Art, the step-by-step -step tutorial on how to forge my painting, Lucrezia Claro. This video is part four out of six, which is part of the curriculum at the unaccredited College of Clare. If you need to go back to the first three videos, you can find them at patreon.com slash Lockhart. In part four, you are going to paint the background, face, clothes, and hair. It can be hard to make an oil painting, especially if you're aiming to do a Renaissance style portrait. However, you can do this as long as you break down the steps into smaller, more manageable pieces. And I'm going to guide you through all the steps of adding a new layer of paint to the background and adding the third layer of paint to the face, plus overlapping the previous work you did on the hair and the clothing. Before we get to work, let's compare these two in-progress photos. So on the left is the end of part three, where I only have one layer of paint on the background, the clothing, the hair, and only two layers of paint on the face. Whereas the photo on the right shows you my portrait at the end of part four. So you can see some pretty big differences already. On the background, that second layer of paint helps hide a lot of those scratchy brush strokes. It makes the painting look a lot cleaner. Furthermore, the new layer of paint on the face makes it a little bit more realistic. And you can see a lot of those shadows are calming down too. The new layer of paint on the clothing, particularly in the veil, allowed me the opportunity to correct some of those colors. You can see I was able to make a more successful blue-green color for that part. Since you are physically applying paint to your canvas, you are building up that surface. Even if you paint really thin like I do, you still need to do the background first because in real life, if you were working with a model, your subject would be in front of, they would be overlapping the background. So we'll take a moment to observe the difference in the background. So on the left in the photograph, there's just that one layer. And on the right, you can see the difference by adding that second layer of gray paint. To paint your background, you're pretty much going to need everything. So your canvas, your photo, your palette, your palette knife, your odorless mineral spirits, your medium, brushes, blah, 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 everything. Now, if you want to do all of this work in one painting session, you can set up your whole palette. But if you are only going to have time to do the background, just make sure you have your warm black, which is a mixture of burnt umber and ultramarine blue, plus your cool black, which is ultramarine blue and burnt umber. That way you can mix up some gray. Remember, start with the white and then gradually add the black to it to make it darker. I recommend having a light gray and a medium gray. You can see on my palette, I have my light and then my medium gray, followed by my warm black, and then I have a little bit of my cool black for the darkest shadows. You want to make sure that you're mixing up enough paint though to cover up that entire surface. It's a lot easier to mix it all up right now than to run out halfway through a step and then try to match that color. Remember, if you make too much, you can save some of it with plastic wrap later on. When I paint the background, I have a little bit of light gray, medium gray, and black on my palette. I also dip my brush in the Gelkid Light and blend it with the paint as I apply it to my canvas. The medium helps push the paint around and it makes the paint a little see-through. The Gelkid Light also helps speed up drying time, which means I only have to wait a day or so before adding additional layers of paint. This is only the second layer of the background and so I use my medium sparingly because I really want to have a solid layer of paint that covers up the canvas and hides all my pencil marks. 
because I'm right-handed, it's easier for me to paint from left to right. If you're left-handed, it will probably be easier for you to paint from right to left. I'm not putting in all the details yet, but I am able to get more specific with my shadows and highlights. I am also able to do a lot of color correction with this layer. Because I have paint on the entire surface of the canvas, it is a lot easier for me to make my colors more accurate. I am using one of my bigger brushes so I can fill in the background quickly. I spent a little over 20 minutes just applying the paint for this step. You don't really want to blend the paint for the backdrop yet, but if you paint fast enough, your colors will mush together as you apply the paint. So when you paint the background, keep in mind that the second layer should completely cover up the first. You'll want to make sure that you're mixing up an adequate amount of paint to be able to do this background all in one sitting. You can get more specific with your colors, so you'll work on matching those colors a little bit more accurately. One of the nice things is that this is a monochromatic background and it gives you a lot of time to practice painting fabric. This will be extremely helpful because this experience will translate very nicely into painting the fabric on the clothing later on. After you're done with the background, you'll move on to putting a new layer of paint down for the face. On the left is the portrait with the new layer of background paint, but on the right is where I added more paint to the face and neck. You'll notice my subject is becoming more lifelike and having a stronger presence. And part of that is because I worked on the eyes this time. When viewers see a portrait, they often make eye contact with it. And if you can observe the specificity in your model and recreate that on your canvas, you're going to give your model, your subject, a stronger presence. And the people who see your painting are going to be drawn to it. When you're doing the eyes, you'll want to make sure that you're getting that variation in the irises and pop those highlights in the correct spots. It's just going to make your painting feel and appear more lifelike. I also worked on creating stronger shadows and putting them in the right spots. You'll notice that the nose looks more three-dimensional after I put this new layer of paint down. I also have stronger shadows carved out around the jawline. When you're working, if looking at the final portrait is throwing you off for this layer, you can always just pause the video at any of these steps and use that to supplement your reference to give you a guide because I know that painting in layers that you can't see can be kind of tricky and so I am showing you all these photographs of my work in progress so that way you can see exactly what I did at each step which will of course lead you on to your career path of becoming a master forger. To paint the face you're going to need everything so have your palette all set up, and if you're doing the face back to back with the background like I did, make sure that you clean off your palette with your glass scraper. You can see there's a pretty straight line underneath my grays and blacks, and that's because I just scraped all that excess paint away to make room for my light, medium, and dark skin tones. I'll also show you how to use a mall stick. This is just a stick that's long enough to go beyond the edges of your canvas and it provides a steady surface for you to rest your hand upon while you're painting without putting your hand in the wet paint you just put on the canvas. First, I work on the eyes. I paint the whites of the eyes with titanium white and some of the skin color. I use a little bit of ultramarine blue for the shadows. 
I used Viridian Green and Yellow Ochre for the irises. I used a small paintbrush and I let the yellow and green smear into each other, but I didn't blend them and make them smooth. After I paint the irises with cool black, I plop in a little titanium white for the highlights in the eyes. I pull the paint from the pupil out to the edge of the iris, and I use a little ultramarine blue around the outer circumferences of the pupils. To keep me from putting my hand in my wet paint, I use a mall stick, but instead of buying a fancy one, I just use a giant dowel. I make sure that the stick goes off the edge of the canvas so I don't put a dent in the canvas. After I finish painting the eyeballs, then I tend to work on the tear ducts and eyelids. I will make the tear ducts by mixing a little alizarin crimson in with some of my light and medium skin colors. I know there are some artists who like to keep their creation process a secret, but I'm happy to share with you because I'm in it for the long-term joke. The art market is incredibly unregulated, and artists never get to see their success after they die, but I am pleased that you're joining me on my quest to mess with the art world. Because you are forging one of my paintings with my help, you are going to have a pretty convincing copy. Whoever analyzes your painting in the future is going to be very confused, and I bet some poor art history grad student will have to write their thesis about you. I know that I've said this before, but it is necessary to be mindful of the direction of your brush strokes when you paint. Think of the neck like a cylinder, and you have to move your brush side to side to make it look three-dimensional. It's okay to paint in the shadows as you see them, even if it means they're vertical. However, when the paint is still wet, wiggle your brush horizontally to correct the direction of the brush strokes. I often like to get the neck painted before the face since the chin appears to overlap the neck, and this helps me create the form of my subject more accurately. Since I have an easier time seeing the shadows, I like to mark those in on the face pretty boldly. Noses are really a challenge to make, but I have found it's easiest to put the nostrils in first and then paint the edges of the alar sidewalls, which are the parts of the nose that encompass the nostrils. Once I have a lot of the nose figured out, it's easier for me to paint the skin around it. When I paint the mouth, I start with the shadow between the lips. I usually draw that line in with black paint mixed with a little alizarin crimson. I paint the mouth by mixing alizarin crimson in with the medium skin colors, and I frequently check with my references to match the variations in color. The corners of the lips in this portrait have more shadows, and there is an obvious highlight on the bottom lip. When I get the mouth painted, I have an easier time painting the corners of the mouth and then the chin. It's important for me to paint the face all in one session so the paint is wet and will blend together for this layer. I'm not going to make everything super smooth, but I do let my colors mush into each other as I go. I'm able to get a better color match than previously since I'm adding new layers of paint on a canvas covered in color. I also want to mention that the reason I add a few drops of gamma salt to my Galkid Light is to thin it out just a little more. This helps me spread the paint on my canvas with ease. I also add a couple drops of gamma salt into the bottle of Galkid Light each time I pour some out, and this helps the medium last a little longer. As you added more details, remember to continually check your reference. It's also a good idea to back up from your canvas to see it from a distance. I don't paint the eyebrows or eyelashes in until the very end, but I often mark where the eyebrows will eventually go by using a slightly duller color than what I use to paint the forehead. Since I know that I'm going to paint another layer of skin, I don't worry about tiny details like eyelashes yet. To re-emphasize your goals for this step, 
you are putting a new layer of paint on the neck, the face, the eyes, and the mouth. And each layer of paint you add makes your portrait look better and better. With the newer layers of paint, you can mix more medium in with your paint. That Gelkid Light is going to make the new paint you put down a little bit see-through, and that allows your previous layers to show through. So it's kind of like putting stacks of stained glass on top of each other. You can see the image through the glass, but the new colors you're adding are affecting the final composition. You don't need to worry about the little details, like don't bother painting in little eyelashes yet. You'll have more painting sessions and you'll do those teeny tiny details at the very end. You can also start to blend your paint a little. You're not going to try and make a super smooth plastic-like surface. But when you put different colors down side by side, so if you're putting a medium skin tone next to a dark skin tone, you can use your brush to just wiggle back and forth and blend that paint at that transition right on your canvas. It'll help you sculpt the face and make it look more three-dimensional. I also want to remind you that it's okay to use the video at this point on pause as a reference for what you're aiming for. Sometimes looking at the final composition can get overwhelming. And so if it helps, you can pause the video right now and look at where I'm at with the face to help you break down the steps even further and make these little steps a little bit more attainable. After you're done with the face, you can move on to painting the clothes and the hair. Remember, we're working in the different layers of how the subject would physically sit in the environment. And so I always will paint the face first and then do the clothes and hair because they're overlapping the model. Hopefully you notice a bit of improvement on my painting in this current state. So on the left is the process photo where I just finished up the face on the newest layer of paint. And on the right, I have added more paint to the clothing, the hair, and the veil. My colors are getting better, my blacks are getting darker, and the hair is starting to look more accurate. To paint the clothes and hair, you're going to need everything again. If you're doing this painting session back to back with what you just accomplished, you'll want to clean off your palette so you have a lot of surface for mixing your new colors. You'll need your warm and cool blacks for the clothing. You'll also need to mix up some new veil colors. So when I created the paint for the veil, I used titanium white, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, viridian green, and yellow ochre. I always try to work over the entire surface of my canvas evenly, which means I build up each layer equally. This helps me make an accurate painting with a lot of depth and shadows. I usually paint light in the beginning and then make my colors and shadows darker as I go. The second layer of black I apply to the clothing is more opaque than my first and it makes a big difference in my progress. For the clothing on this painting, I let the brush strokes stick off the surface of the canvas so this painting won't be completely flat and smooth. Because I'm depicting black clothing, I like to use my cool black to put the shadows in first. I'm using a little gray for the highlights for the satin fabric on the corset. When the paint is still wet, I smudge the different colors into each other to create a smoother, silky texture. For the veil, I was able to get a more accurate color mixed than my first attempt. 
I used Viridian Green, Cobalt Blue, which is a warm blue, Yellow Ochre, and Ultramarine Blue, which is the cool blue. I used more Ultramarine Blue in the darker mixture because it's cool and will recede. I used more Cobalt Blue in the lighter mixture because it's warmer and will pop out more. Viridian Green is pretty translucent, and when I use the medium, it creates a layer almost like stained glass. I mixed up light and medium blue-green by starting with white and adding my teal to it. I created a very dark blue-green for the shadows by just combining the blues, green, plus yellow ochre. I omitted the white from that mixture. I intentionally paint the first layers lighter than what I want in the end because I know that the light colors will shine through the top layers and that will create a lot of depth and texture for me. It's okay that my first layer of the veil was too blue because this layer with a lot of green corrects the color and I was able to add more details to the fabric. I am painting everything in one session so I can blend the paint together to get a smooth texture. This opaque layer of hair is really going to make your painting start to come together since your canvas surface will finally be 100% covered with bold paint. I often paint the hair last because it overlaps the head and the clothes, but this composition has a veil so it's a little more complex than typical portraits. It's a good idea to block in the darkest areas with cool black first. Then, Paint over most of the hair with burnt umber. While the paint is still wet, quickly add a few brush strokes of yellow ochre for the shiny highlights, but leave those brush strokes noticeable. This will sculpt the texture of the hair. Use a little titanium white, that's the warm white, for the shiniest areas of the hair. Don't smooth or blend the hair together. Hair has a much different texture than skin and fabric. It will probably look weird up close, but in real life, we can't see every individual strand of hair, just the main blocks of shadows and highlights. Most people will see your painting from a distance, and using this painting strategy will make the hair look good when your composition is on display. Once you get this far, check out your painting from a distance. You should be proud of the progress that you're making. To finish up part four, you're going to add more paint to the clothes and hair. As you're working, you're going to continually correct colors. So on the veil, I used a dark blue-green overall, and I combined cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, viridian green, and a little yellow ochre. Now for the shadows, I did put in a little burnt umber to desaturate that color to make it darker and duller. I didn't use black in those shadows because the shadows aren't black, but it's a very similar concept because the main colors are ultramarine blue and burnt umber. I want to remind you that you can blend the paint on the fabric, but don't do the hair. To blend the paint on the fabric, what I did was I put the colors down on the canvas and then I took a clean dry brush and put half and half on each of the two colors and just wiggle the brush back and forth and I mix the paint directly on the surface of the canvas. One of the big advantages of using oil paint is you have a long time to work with and manipulate the paint and that permits me the ability to blend the colors right on my surface and that's how I get those smoother transitions on the face and on the silky parts of the clothing. When you're painting the hair, focus on the highlights and the shadows. It's overall going to be brown, but there's black in the shadows and then there's that yellow ochre and some white for the highlights. And remember, don't blend, don't mush the paint together on the hair. You want to keep that hair texture looking very different from all of the cloth in the portrait.
after you complete part four, you'll be two thirds done with this project and you've got this. It's amazing that you are undertaking such a big project. I know so many people who go to museums, look at the work on the walls and go, I could do that. But I have never actually met anyone who goes home, gets a canvas the exact same size as the painting they thought they could do and makes a perfect replica. You are doing such a strange conceptual contemporary project by forging a painting by a current living artist and you're doing it to scale. I hope that you are sharing your progress with your friends and other people within your social circle because this is an unusual project and you are doing some pretty cool work. After you're all done with part four of Steal My Art, the forgery of Lucrezia Claro, please head on over to patreon.com to get to part five. Remember, there's only six parts to this series as part of the curriculum of the unaccredited College of Clare, and soon you'll be ready to see video five at patreon.com slash Claire Lockhart.